Good morning, and welcome to our discussion this morning entitled Rent Control, Constitutionality, Private Property, and the Distortion of Housing Markets. I'm Howard Husick, a senior fellow here at the American Enterprise Institute, where I focus on municipal government, urban housing policy, civil society, and philanthropy. Rent control, or government regulation of local rent prices, tends to be a divisive policy wherever it's found. Its advocates defend it as a crucial protection for tenants in cities where prices would be unaffordable because of high demand and limited supply. Regulated rents, it said, protect lower income tenants. Rent control critics worry that the policy provides benefits for tenants of any income at the expense of property owners who may themselves be of modest means. And that regulation inhibits natural turnover, protecting incumbents. The term econ economists Ed Glazer and David Cutler of Harvard are using these days to explain economic lethargy in some cities. But whether or not rent regulation is ill-advised policy, can we go so far as to say that it's unconstitutional? That's the claim we'll consider today. Attorneys for the Rent Stabilization Association of New York, a group of some 25,000 property owners, assert that rent regulation, as per the law in New York, which has the nation's largest rent-regulated housing stock, amounts to a taking of private property and thus should not stand. They have filed suit in federal district court where their arguments will shortly be heard. We'll hear this morning from constitutional lawyer Andrew Pincus, representing the property owners group. He'll be joined by AEI's own constitutional scholar, Adam White, who will help guide us through the context of those instances in which courts have found that public policy can constitute a taking. And finally, to help us sort through all of that, Nestor Davidson of the Fordham University School of Law, who will provide further analysis wearing in part his hat as former deputy counsel at the Department of Housing and Urban, Urban Development. Before we begin, we want to make our audience aware of a Q&A section in the last 15 minutes of this discussion. If you have a question you'd like to submit, please submit it to the email listed below on the screen or to the hashtag AEI Rent Control. A bit more about each panelist. First, Andrew Pincus is a partner in Mayor Brown LLP. He's a resident in Washington. His practice focuses on, on the Supreme Court and appellate litigation. He has argued 30 cases in the Supreme Court of the United States. He's a former assistant to the Solicitor General in the Department of Justice and co-founded and serves as co-director of the Yale Law School Supreme Court Advocacy Clinic. Next, Adam White, senior fellow here at AEI, where he focuses on American constitutionalism, the Supreme Court, and the administrative state. Concurrently, he's assistant professor of law and the director of the C. Boyd and Gray Center for the Study of the Administrative State at the Antonin Scalia Law School at George Mason. He's also a member of President Biden's bipartisan commission looking at potential restructuring of the United States Supreme Court. Nestor Davidson is the Albert A. Walsh Chair in Real Estate Land Use and Property Law and Faculty Director of the Urban Law Center at Fordham Law School. He's published widely in the fields of property law, affordable housing, law and policy, and state and local government law. We're going to begin with Adam White. Adam, because the idea of an unconstitutional taking is at the heart of the legal argument we're going to hear about, could you give us kind of a short course on takings that might potentially be relevant to the discussion today? Sure, Howard. I'd be glad to. Uh and I'll keep it short, the long course gets much more expensive in the law schools. <laughs> where, where, where does the taking, where, where does the term taking come from? It comes from the Fifth Amendment, first and foremost, which provides that the federal government may not, among other things, uh, take private property. Uh, well, the quote is, nor shall private property be taken for public use without just compensation. So that's where the word taking comes from. And while the Fifth Amendment's focused on the federal government, it's been what we call incorporated against state governments through the 14th Amendment. Now, the classic takings are eminent domain, where a government actually takes title to land, transfers it to, to government ownership for public use. Of course, I think we all know in our day-to-day -day lives that, that laws outside of, of eminent domain, they place burdens on us, some more than others. And often it seems as though a law that's short of outright confiscation can still feel like the equivalent of a taking. 
Now, the Supreme Court's grappled with that for a very, very long time. About a century ago, in 1922, Justice Holmes, in a case called Pennsylvania Coal, said, quote, the general rule, at least, is that while property may be regulated to a certain extent, if regulation goes too far, it will be recognized as a taking. And that's the classic challenge. When does a regulation go too far so that it's not just a limitation on your use of property, but an but such a burden on your use of property that your property has been effectively taken from you? The do, These doctrines of regulations constituting takings are what we now think we, we now call appropriately enough regulatory takings. And the classic Supreme Court case on the subject is from 1973 in a case called Penn Central. Uh, in that case, the New York, uh, New York City Landmarks Commission denied an application for the building of a 50-story office building on top of Grand Central. And the owners of the property argued that that denial of, of their application uh, denied their ability to derive profit from the property. The court did not declare that a taking, but the court did set out a, a kind of nebulous three-factor test on how they would think through whether a regulation goes so far as to be a regulatory taking. They said, we'll look at the economic impact of the regulation. We'll look at the regulation's interference with what they called investment-backed expectations. And we'll also look at the character of the government action, which I'll get back to in just a second. Needless to say, that's a very, very nebulous standard, that three-factor test. About 20 years ago, the Supreme Court, uh, in a, a case involving a home-building moratorium in, in a local community in, in Tahoe, and, and whether that constituted a regulatory, regulatory taking, the court pulled some quotes from old cases and said, our regulatory takings jurisprudence is of a more recent vintage, and it's characterized by essentially ad hoc factual inquiries designed to allow... Uh, the the um, the careful examination and weighing of all relevant circumstances. If I remember correctly, I think John Roberts, before he was Chief Justice Roberts, may have been the counsel for the homeowners or the, the property owners in that case. So the court itself admits that regulatory takings is a very, very nebulous standard. It's a bit ad hoc, a weighing of different factors. Um, things like zoning laws, those are not automatically takings. But the court has created a couple of subcategories that we can think of as per se takings, regulations that in the court's estimation uh, constitute an inherent taking. One is just a permanent physical occupation. If the government places something on your land or allows others to place something on your land permanently, that is a taking. The classic case here, again, coming from New York, this time New York State about 40 years ago, it involved cable TV installations, <clears throat> and the court held that when New York State required uh, landlords to allow the installation of cable cable TV equipment on their property, that was a per se regulatory taking because mm -hmm. it was a permanent placement of physical objects on property. So physical uh, permanent physical occupations is one per se taking. The other is just the total denial of economically viable use. In the case here, a classic one from 30 years ago, Lucas versus South Carolina Coastal Commission, the court held that when the state of South Carolina imposed new limitations that effectively prohibited a landowner from developing at all his beachfront property, that was a taking. The government hadn't claimed title to the land, but they had prohibited the landowner from any economic use of that part of the property. Now, outside of those categories, though, outside of per se takings, again, things get very, very complicated, and I won't go too far into detail because I, I, I want to make sure to turn things over to our next two speakers. But one example I'll give you, though, is what we call exactions or conditions, you might think of them. When the government grants you a permit or an approval of some kind but conditions it on you giving something back to the government, the court asks whether there is a reasonable nexus, they call it, a, um, an essential nexus between the approval that the private property owner is seeking and the condition or the exaction that the government is placing on, uh, on that approval. And the court in later cases has looked at whether there's a rough proportionality between what the government is giving and what the government is taking. Just one last note, everything that I've described so far, while it's based on the notion of a constitutional taking, 
has never really been clearly and specifically grounded in the Constitutional's original meaning. And Justice Thomas has pointed this out a couple of times very recently. In 2017, in a dissenting opinion in a takings case, he, he wrote a very, very short dissent saying that although the parties in that case had not themselves called for a re, sort of a reconsideration or a rebuilding of the court's regulatory takings precedents, he thought, or he suggested, maybe the time has come for the court to rebuild this from the ground up. He said the court has never purported to ground those precedents on regulatory takings in the Constitution as it was originally understood. That was in 2017. Now, just about six months ago, eight months ago, uh, in February of this year, Justice Thomas again issued a statement on the subject. Here, in a dissent from the court's denial of, of cert in a case, he wrote, quote, Our current regulatory takings jurisprudence leaves much to be desired. As one might imagine, nobody, not states, not property owners, not courts, nor juries, has any idea how to apply this standardless account of the, that is the, the three-factor Penn Central case on regulatory takings. So this is a very, very interesting time in the court on, on the subject of regulatory takings. If the court returns to this issue anytime soon, you could see it decide the next case or cases within existing precedent, or you could see a number of the justices trying to re-found the doctrine on notions of, of uh, in this case, say the 14th Amendment's Privileges or Immunities Clause. So it's a very interesting and nebulous standard. It's very complicated. That's why they, they hire people like Andy Pincus uh, to handle these cases. And Howard, I'll turn it back to you to turn it over to Andrew. Thank you so much, Adam, for that uh, concise and provocative summary uh, of the takings history at the court. Uh, you've set us up to think that this case could be of the moment. Uh, certainly many New Yorkers think it's of the moment. Uh, let me turn it over to Andy. This idea that rent regulation might be unconstitutional has been tested before in the courts and has never been struck down. What makes you think, first of all, where does the case stand now, just in terms of the schedule, and then go on to what makes you think that you've got a better and a new case and a chance? Sure. Thanks, Howard, and, and thanks to AEI for, uh, for convening this uh, discussion on a topic that I obviously think is pretty is pretty interesting and timely. Um, in terms of where the case stands now, uh, fully briefed before the Second Circuit, the district court dismissed our complaint. Uh, not a surprise given, as, as you say, there were some Second Circuit cases that had rejected challenges to prior versions of New York uh, rent regulation. Uh, so we're waiting for an argument date uh, from the Second Circuit. Uh, I, I guess why we think the case will come out differently is a, a combination of two things. First of all, the New York law has become uh, significantly more draconian in terms of its impact on property owners. There was a significant revision passed in 2019. Uh, we think the law even before that had significant constitutional problems, but they're certainly amplified by that change. And also changes in the law. The Supreme Court in recent years in a series of decisions has uh, become more protective of property rights, including two decisions just earlier this year at the end of uh, the last term in June. Uh, and we think the combination of those two factors uh, creates a very strong argument that, that this current New York rent stabilization law uh, constitutes a taking. And, and we have three different theories. Let me, let me spell them out quickly. Uh, and I wanna say, there are a lot of policy reasons uh, why rent regulation uh, may be bad policy, is bad policy uh, in the housing market, but I'm gonna focus here, happy to talk about policy, but I'm gonna focus here on, on the constitutional questions. Um, so our first theory uh, really takes off uh, from the physical taking uh, argument, uh, per se physical taking rule that Adam was talking about. As he said, the court has said, that in some circumstances, uh, a taking is per se, a, a rent a, a regulation is a per se taking. You don't have to engage in the balancing test that he talked about. And I think some people had argued uh, before this June that that category was restricted to for permanent physical occupations. But the court in a case called Cedar Point uh, said, no, that's not right. Cedar Point concerned a California regulation that uh, empowered union organizers to go on farmland uh, to organize uh, workers. Uh, it allowed uh, 
up to three hours a day for 120 days per year. And the court said that was a per se physical taking, even though it was not a permanent occupation. And what the court said is the property owner's right to exclude, the right to determine who comes on his or her property and the use of the property is fundamental, and that that California regulation intruded on that right to exclude. Uh, we think the New York rent stabilization law does exactly the same thing. And, and let me explain for a minute, because the rent stabilization law, I think when people think rent control, they think, oh, there's a regulation of rent levels. But the New York law goes far beyond regulating rent levels uh, to basically uh, all but require, and in practical terms, require that property, once it's covered by the rent stabilization law, always is going to be covered by the rent stabilization law, and the property owner can't change it. Uh, let me just quickly tick off what those regulations are. Um, first of all, once you are a tenant in a rent stabilized apartment, you have the right to perpetual renewals unless you engage in some harmful or, or unlawful conduct. Uh, not only that, but that right can be transferred to successors. If you have a roommate and you leave, the roommate can uh, exercise that right to rent in perpetuity. If you have a if you're elderly and you have a caregiver, uh, after about a year or so, the caregiver can take over that right. If you have a relative who lives with you, uh, the relative can take over that right. I have to parenthetically say, people of a certain age who watched Friends might remember that Monica lived in her grandmother's rent-stabilized apartment and got the benefit of rent stabilization. I thought that was sort of a uh, artistic license, but no, that's actually what, what New York law does. Uh, the property owner can't convert the property to, for example, commercial uh, rentals. The only way to uh, convert it convert it to a commercial purpose is if the property owner uses it entirely for himself or herself. Uh, the property owner can't demolish the property uh, without finding other places for rent-stabilized tenants to live or, and in many cases, paying them significant amounts of money. Uh, the property owner can't convert it to a condominium. Uh, even a non-eviction condominium plan, unless 51% of the tenants agree. Um, and the property owner can't take back uh, an apartment uh, from an existing tenant uh, for his own use or her own use uh, without satisfying a very high standard uh, and only one apartment. So that series of regulations, we think, are much more draconian than uh, the statute that the court was dealing with in the farm worker case in terms of the restrictions on the property owner's right to exclude and right to determine the use of, of the property. So we think that makes out the kind of physical taking, per se taking claim that the court uh, recognized in Cedar Point. Um, let me quickly sketch out our, our other two theories just to get them on the table, uh, because I obviously other Want to look forward to discussing. Um, our second theory uh, is a variant of a regulatory taking theory that uh, was recognized by Justices Scalia and O'Connor in a case called Pinnell. The full court has never dealt with it. But, but what they said in that case, and that was a rent regulation case, was that um, there are some public purposes uh, that should be borne by the public at large, not by individual property owners. It has nothing to do with their ownership or use of the property. Um, and uh, what they said is in that case, because the rent regulation standard required consideration of ability to pay, and just parenthetically, most price controls, price regulation, if you think of the regulation of power or of utilities, uh, is a reasonable rate of return. The 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 regulated entity is allowed to recover its costs and a reasonable rate of return. Uh, but this rent regulation statute was different because it also required consideration of the tenant's ability to pay. And what they said is, in that case was, that's a different kettle of fish, and that is another category of per se taking. And we think, first of all, the New York rent statute does require consideration of ability to pay in setting rent levels. Uh, one thing that's amazing about the rent level regulation is that the New York City Rent Stabilization Board has an index of property owners' costs. And over the last 20 years, that index has gone up twice as quickly as the rent increases that property owners have been allowed. In other words, property owners have been allowed to recover through rent increases only half of what the board itself says are their increased costs, so pretty remarkable. And the New York Court of Appeals has said in describing this law 
that it's a local public assistance benefit. So we think we have a pretty strong argument under the theory advanced by Justices Scalia and O'Connor. And then finally, uh, we do think that under the Penn Central test that Adam described, uh, nebulous though it is, uh, we have a very strong argument uh, that this regulation flunks that test. And just to tick quickly off uh, some of the relevant factors and then I'll stop, um, the character of the regulation, as I said, this is a physical invasion that really dramatically limits the property owner's rights. Um, the court said when government is regulating a noxious use, it probably has more authority to regulate. There's no noxious use here. Um, most property regulations think zoning are justified by what's called reciprocity of advantage. The property owner is limited. If you're in a, if your property is in an area zoned only for housing, you can't build a factory, uh, but your neighbor can't either. And so that helps, gives your property additional value from the fact that you're gonna be in a residential neighbor. There's no reciprocity of advantage here. The property owner bears all the burdens of rent regulation, but doesn't get any benefit. And the economic burden is, is quite significant. We demonstrated uh, in our, a study that we talked about in our complaint, a significant diminution in property value of rent stabilized apartments compared to other apartments. So anyway, let me, let me stop there and uh, look forward uh, to discussing this further. Thank you so much, Andy. Uh, Nestor Davidson, let me turn to you. And uh, I'm not gonna ask you to uh, be the, uh, uh, defend, de, to defend the law, that's up to the state of New York. But I would like to get your sense of how Andy's arguments are likely to play with the court. How do you think they will take them in and uh, reconcile them with the takings uh, jurisprudence that Adam has talked to us about? Great. Thank you, Howard. And, and thank you for doing this. It's a really important topic. So uh, uh, to, to pick up on your question, I really do think that uh, what is likely to happen uh, is that uh, with all due respect to Andy, and they've put together a terrific brief, uh, and it's some, some great argument, I think they're going to lose uh, on all three claims uh, before the Second Circuit. I actually don't think it's going to be close, and I'll just briefly talk about why. Uh, but I actually think that 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 if this ends up being a vehicle to get the idea of rent regulation before the Supreme Court, uh, it's a very, very different ball, ball game for reasons that both Adam and, and Andy have talked about. So so let me just take a minute and, and, and give you a, a sort of quick reason why or set of reasons why I think the Second Circuit is going to reject all three of the, the, the theories, the regulatory takings theories. And we can talk also about due process, which we're not really... Uh, talking about, but 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 let's focusing on takings first on the argument that uh, 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 rent regulation and tenant protections uh, and the ability to of a of a jurisdiction, New York State, New York City, to limit the ability of landlords to remove property from the market. Um, you know, the, there is some lower court jurisprudence, uh, some in California, some in other places that goes both ways on this. But essentially, the Supreme Court made that argument very difficult in a 1992 unanimous opinion called Ye Against City of Escondido, which involved uh, a, a, a mobile home regulation. Uh, and the court really was confronted after this earlier case, Loretto, about whether or not rent regulation and tenant protections constituted a, a, a physical occupation. And the court said, no, when a landlord enters the market, the, the state is then entitled to regulate the terms of, land, of the landlord-tenant relationship. So unlike the cable that was at issue uh, uh, that Adam mentioned in the Loretto case, landlord-tenant relations falls in a completely different category. And this is the regulation of use, not the uh, 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 permanent or otherwise. And we'll talk in a second about uh, the court's gotten rid of the distinction between temporary and permanent physical occupations. Um, but this is not a physical occupation in the sense that the Loretto and line, that line of cases uh, meant. Now, uh, Andy has some great arguments for distinguishing E. Uh, I think the Supreme Court may be very open to them. I don't think the Second Circuit will be at all. Um, and we can talk about that more in the Q&A. So that's the first argument. The second is what Andy describes as his Pennell argument, which comes from a two justice dissent from a 1988 case. I think that, that again, the Second Circuit, uh, you know, the idea that, that owners should not be required to bear uh, special burdens, 
is really just the, the purpose of the takings clause. And it comes from a case, a Supreme Court case from the 1940s called Armstrong. And what we call the Armstrong principle is a really general principle that is meant to animate all takings law, both eminent domain and regulatory takings. I don't see the Second Circuit, and again, we'll see what happens with the Supreme Court. I don't see the Second Circuit creating a new rule, whether it's per se or otherwise, that picks up on Scalia and, and O'Connor's dissent in, in Pinnell. Um, it's just not within the kind of role identity of a court of appeals, and I don't think the Second Circuit is going to take that argument. The final argument is just the general Penn Central argument, the balancing the ad hoc, what Adam describes as the kind of all facts and circumstances. And again, here, you know, rent regulation, even fairly intrusive rent regulation, in fact, the uh, earlier versions of the same regime have been upheld by the Second Circuit repeatedly. And I think the biggest challenge before the Second Circuit I won't belabor the point, is that they that Andy has brought what's called a facial challenge. And we haven't really talked about the distinction between a facial challenge and an as-applied challenge. But the, the burden on a plaintiff bringing a facial constitutional challenge to a statute like this is that you have to show that there are no circumstances under which the statute could be found constitutional. And perhaps in an as-applied challenge, a specific owner could say that the application of this set of rent regulations and tenant protections is so onerous as to violate the uh, Penn Central standard. But it's a very, very high standard to meet if what you're saying is that all landlords affected by the regulation across the city of New York, and Andy makes the argument, but I think it's gonna be a very hard argument for the Second Circuit to accept that no landlord under any circumstances that this could be found constitutional. Um, and the idea that the Second Circuit is going to use Penn Central to overturn a regime that in various versions goes all the way back to World War I um, that was upheld by the Supreme Court in a case uh, after the war, actually 1921, called Block Against Hirsch. Obviously, the policy differences are not insignificant. I don't want to say that they don't matter and that the 1999 amendments weren't significant. They were. But from a constitutional perspective, I don't think this is uh, the, the straw that will have broken the constitutional camel's back. So all of that to say that, that I admire the, the, the arguments. I don't think they're going to succeed before the Second Circuit. But I think that things could be very, very different when we get to the Supreme Court, Howard. So uh, 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 Andy mentioned uh, Cedar Point Nursery against Hasid, this case from June. And that really changed the entire framework of how we think about, quote unquote, physical occupations. And the court was uh, uh, much more definitive in the argument that almost any physical occupation, if the government authorizes it, approves it, mandates it. And again, these are private occupations. The, the labor organizers in, in the Cedar Point nursery case uh, were private parties who were given a very limited right, a couple of hours a day, a couple of, you know, a certain number of days of the year before work, after work, during lunch. Uh, and the Supreme Court found that to be a per se taken. And, and so the Supreme Court has signaled in Cedar Point Nursery that they are going to think very, very differently about the right to exclude. And Andy didn't mention it, but even since June, the court on multiple occasions has referred back either citing Loretto or citing Cedar Point Nursery in a series of cases for a court, uh, you know, for those of us who teach and write and think about property law, it's suddenly, uh, uh, you know, constitutional property week. Um, and I'm teaching property this fall. And so there's lots and lots of great grist for the mill. But I'll just mention very briefly three cases, and then, Howard, I'll hand it back to you. Um, so in one case, um, uh, 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 a case called Pack Dell against San Francisco, which really dealt primarily with uh, uh, some technical issues about when you can bring a takings case in federal court um, and some cleanup from an earlier recent opinion that also took a very strong pro-property rights view. The Supreme Court dropped a footnote and said that the Ninth Circuit on remand in this case had to think about it involved the tenant protection uh, regime in San Francisco. And the court said the Ninth Circuit needs to evaluate what that set of regulations and their view of that those regulations being in the wake of Cedar Point Nursery. And for those who sort of live in the footnotes, uh, as we like to do of Supreme Court cases, that was a clarion call that they are rethinking this area of the law. Briefly, uh, in, in the case striking down the CDC's eviction moratorium, there's a, a kind of random aside, uh, totally unnecessary, totally dictum. Uh, but the court said this uh, CDC moratorium interferes with the most sacred right of landlords, which is the right to exclude. 
again, it's not germane. That was not that was a, a, a non-delegation case. Essentially, it was about statutory authority. But it was a very telling signal that the court is rethinking this whole area of law. And then finally, um, uh, there's a case called Chrysophis against Marx, which involved New York State's emergency moratorium. It was a due process case. But in striking that down, uh, and, and the eviction moratoriums have been upheld by lower courts across the country, but in striking it down, again, on due process, right to access to the court's ground, the court had some very, very strong landlord uh, 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 language about the importance of, of, of landlord rights here. So I think what Andy is doing, and I think uh, uh, he is serving his clients well, is uh, I think he's going to take one for the team before the Second Circuit. But I think there's a not insignificant chance that the Supreme Court takes this case. And I really can't predict what they're going to do. But I won't be surprised if they use this as a vehicle, whether under uh, uh, the, the no right to exclude version, the sort of post Cedar Point, or even some broader uh, opportunity. And I know they're eager to do this to revisit. As Adam pointed out, they're very eager to revisit the kind of open-ended, uh, 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 broad textured Penn Central standard. So stay tuned. Well, let me just follow up on that quickly, Nestor. Yeah. Andy basically said that he was, he thought this was a propitious time for bringing this back to the courts because this new version of the re regulation law was, was quite different. You seem to be saying, correct me if I'm wrong, that it's the court's change that's more important than the law's change. Yes, I think that's right. And, and again, I think it's, it's subject to reasonable disagreement. But, but courts, and especially I think the Second Circuit, given the complexity of the regime, given the complexity of the housing market in New York, frankly, given the housing crisis that we continue to face, and again, we can have an argument and a discussion and a reasonable discussion about the merits of the policy. But that's not what the Second Circuit's going to do. They're not going to parse this to a fine grain and say that this incremental set of changes fundamentally crosses the line. I could be wrong, but I don't think they're going to do that. These are these are changes in degree, not kind. Uh, and I think they are not inclined to, they won't be inclined to say that this is such a different degree of changes that it takes it out of the precedent that uh, has upheld versions of rent regulation, rent control, uh, tenant protections in, in other cases. And so Andy, has, has Nestor got your thinking right uh, in terms of the staging? I, I know you're not going to say that you're prepared for a, an adverse decision, but do you see this as something that were there to be an adverse decision uh, in the Second Circuit, you think there would be reason to take it to the Supreme Court? Uh, absolutely. Um, you know, as you say, I'm not prepared to give up on the Second Circuit. I think we've got some some strong arguments. And because I'm an advocate, I'd say both the changes in the law, the New York law, and the changes in jurisprudence from recent Supreme Court decisions are significant. Um, but let me give you one example. A lot of the prior Second Circuit decisions um, relied on this concept called acquiescence or voluntarily being in the market. They said, you landlords, either you bought the building after uh, rent stabilization was in effect, so you sort of knew what you were getting into, uh, or you you've stayed in the, rent, in the tenant uh, residential housing market. And, and so you sort of take the, in a phrase that Chief Justice Rehnquist wants to use, you take the bitter with the sweet in terms of, of what you've got. But the Supreme Court, in a couple of decisions prior to the Cedar Point decision that we're talking about, basically said, rejected this acquiescence theory and said, you know, that the government doesn't essentially get to grant, uh, get a grandfather benefit from uh, unconstitutional regulations. Once they've been laundered through a change in property, they can't be challenged. They rejected that in a case called Palazzolo. Uh, and then the Chief Justice, in a more recent case involving, of all things, raisins, uh, private property, but nonetheless subject to the takings clause, said the fact that the federal government there said, well, these raisin growers, you know, they could use their grapes for something else. They're voluntarily in the raisin business. So they sort of take the regulation where they found it and, and the court rejected that argument squarely. So I think a lot of the existing Second Circuit precedent uh, can't really be defended because they rest it rested on that ground. Now, will the Second Circuit agree with our, our arguments? That's a different kettle of fish. But I will say that the Yee case that Nestor mentioned uh, 
has a, a pretty clear limitation in it. What the court said in that case is, we're not going to say that regulation of sort of landlord-tenant relationships constitutes a per se physical taking, but incredibly important is that the property owner can get out of the tenant game in six to 12 months. And the court said this would be a very different case if that weren't true. And a critical part of our case, uh, as I said, is that basically once an apartment is covered by rent stabilization, it's effectively locked in for quite a long time. But, but, but I time. infer that you would not be deterred from appealing the case were you to get an adverse and you might be even encouraged by some of the factors that Nestor has discussed. Yes, I, I don't think, you know, I, I think to some extent, as Nestor and Adam have both said, the law is changing and unsettled in this area and lower courts may be uh, reluctant. We, of course, want to spur them on to take their best crack at what they think the Supreme Court would, would do and to recognize that these recent decisions undermine the Second Circuit's prior decisions. But, but certainly, you know, we've recognized from the beginning that this is a case that might have to get to the Supreme Court before the principles can really be looked at uh, in, in, in the way that the court is now looking generally at this area of the law. Well, let me turn back to Adam. Uh, and I want to refer, the the defendants have a quite uh, impressive brief of their own. Uh, they raise the voluntary participation argument that you just uh, discussed, Andy. Uh, but they also say, and this matters a lot in terms of the deference that courts give to state and local government, uh, that New York has a quote-unquote rational basis to ensure a stock of low-priced housing. And that should survive this facial challenge. Does that argument matter a lot? Is it likely to, to uh, 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 carry water with the with the courts? Well, I mean, it beats conceding that the argument is that there's an irrational basis for it. <laughs> um, so much of the court's regulatory takings jurisprudence, it is based on implicit balances that the court has tried to strike and uh, ends means connections between what the government is trying to achieve and how much of a burden it places on private property owners. And so I think it does make sense for them to highlight what they see as the rational basis for this regulation. It puts them on some stronger footing. Um, but I think, I mean, I've, it's been a little while since I've looked at the brief, so I, I, I don't want to overstate it because I don't know if they were trying to map that particular point onto a very, very specific legal argument. Can I add just a couple more points, Howard, Please. on this? Um, the point Andy made a moment ago about the Second Circuit precedents being a little out of step with the Supreme Court's new trajectory, even when that's the case, um, at least as far as I can recall from my own practice, you know, the general line of thinking in the circuits is that unless a Supreme Court decision really explicitly overturns circuit precedent, mm -hmm. the circuit judges are very, very loath to, con to, to construe their own precedent as in conflict with the Supreme Court precedent. The circuit sitting, what we call en banc, all of the judges, not just the three judge panel, of course they can change their own precedents, but the circuits are often very slow to actually concede that their precedents conflict with, with a more recent Supreme Court precedent. And so we'll see how that plays out in the, in the second circuit. I do wanna though broaden the discussion slightly and point out that in addition to the discussions the Supreme Court's had about regulatory takings per se, some of the other things that are kind of in the ether around the court, um, I think will inform or at least be in the background of how the court considers these issues if it does return to them. And these they cut in different directions. Um, first, I'd say in favor of the property owners, the Supreme Court's seen other contexts in recent years where government policy, welfare policy of some sort or social policy of some sort is filtered through the private sector. We've seen that in the Affordable Care Act context and things like the employer mandate and so on, where the private sector is in effect deputized to carry out and in some ways subsidize um, social policy or social welfare policy. Um, we saw it also in the arguments surrounding, I think it was the Hobby Lobby case, it might've been the successor case involving the Little Sisters of the Poor on the Religious Freedom Restoration Act. When the court was considering whether um, new regulations were an unconstitutional burden on the exercise of religion because the private sector employers were being required under the law to grant benefits for, say, contraception and so on for their employees. 
number of the justices pointed out, look, the government could sort of cut out the middleman and just fund these things directly, mm -hmm. minimize the burden on the private sector. And obviously that's a different case and under, under a specific statute. Um, so it's different. But I have to think the justice's experiences in the last few years are going to inform the way they look at this case. Now, in the other direction, I'll just point out, the justices have spent a, a lot of time, a number of them in the last few years, rethinking what's called the non-delegation doctrine, um, whether the uh, um, you know, what role the court should have to enforce constitutional, a major constitutional principle that really isn't clearly spelled out in constitutional text. More recently, they heard a case involving the theory of political gerrymanders, that sometimes a gerrymander is so partisan that it crosses a constitutional line and becomes unconstitutional. In both of those lines of cases, which again are very different from what we're discussing here, the justices have struggled to think through whether the court is equipped to draw a very clear, judicially enforceable line in the absence of really precise constitutional text. Um, I think that those two cases, political gerrymanders and non-delegation, they come from very different sort of political ideologies, but I think they've had a lot in common as the justices have tried to find clarity where in the constitutional text there isn't really precision. And if this issue of the, the regulatory takings and, and the rent stabilization law returns to the Supreme Court, it's very much going to be, uh, it's, it's going to ver very much raise similar concerns and challenges as people advocate for the court to try to draw a precise, legal, uh, judicially enforceable line. Uh, before I turn back to our, our panel, I want to remind our audience that we're eager to get your questions so that I could then uh, pose them to the panel in some of the time that we have remaining and you can see that on your screen how you can do that. Uh, uh, let me ask you, Andy, a, a really obnoxious question, uh, which is, could you imagine a constitutional version of rent regulation that contrasts in a way with the current regime that would not make it vulnerable to some of the challenges that Adam and Nestor have talked about? No, and we've said we've we said in our complaint we don't think all regulation of rent levels uh, is unconstitutional. That would be a pretty foolish position to take, since there are price regulations in various sectors of the economy. Again, separating myself from uh, policy from uh, from constitutional limits. So clearly, there are constitutional versions. Uh, our position here is that New York, for some of the reasons I've said and other things we haven't had time to talk about in terms of the actual setting of the rent levels, uh, has gone way over way over the constitutional line. Um, one thing that's interesting, just picking up on Adam's last point, is if you listen to the oral argument in the Cedar Point case, uh, obviously, California, who was defending the law, a big argument was this is not a per se physical taking. It should be analyzed under the Penn Central rubric. And basically, from the justices' questions and even from some of the advocates' responses, including California's, there was basically a recognition that uh, you know, Penn Central is where takings claims go to die, that, that basically there are very, very few, if any, lower court decisions that say, oh, yes, this regulation flunks this balancing test. And I, I think that may well have been one of the reasons that led the court, the majority, to say, well, if we want the takings guarantee, it is it written in the Constitution, it must mean something. If we want it to be real, uh, we have to think about whether there's something broader to this uh, category of per se physical takings, which is what they ended up doing. Uh, but I do, I think there the un, the other undercurrent of the argument is, uh, as Adam said and, and Nestor said, some dissatisfaction with the Penn Central test as a way to actually protect property owners given its sort of balancing nature. Okay, I've got a, a, a slew of questions coming in. And I'm not going to try to paraphrase these questions because they're somewhat technical in nature. So I'm going to rely on uh, the, the panelists to whom I direct them to help me me make sense of them too. Uh, if Number one, if compelled renewal and compelled secession are per se takings, how are a renewal slash secession for a private apartment a public use? Is it a public use? Is there a distinction to be made between public benefit as in Justice Thomas's Kelo dissent 
and public use. I'm going to throw that to Nestor. Does that make sense to you, the question? Yes. And, and it's a little bit of apples and oranges, which is- Before you answer, help us understand that question. Yes. Okay. So uh, uh, in this case called Kilo against New London, the issue was use of the power of eminent domain, the government actually taking title. So a different category. We're not in the world of regulatory takings. And the disagreement, it was a 5-4 decision. Uh, the majority was written by uh, former Justice Stevens. But the disagreement was over another provision of, of the takings clause or a provision of the takings clause that says that the government can only take, can expropriate property for public use. And uh, several of the dissents had, had various versions of how narrow that should be. This was for economic development in New London. And the majority said that we're really going to understand public use right. to be a public purpose. And we're going to defer to the legislature, as we do, Adam pointed out, in, in the kind of general due process sense, uh, that if there's a disagreement about whether this is a good idea or a bad idea, as long as there's a legitimate public purpose, we're going to defer to the political branches to make that decision. And so the question is, uh, 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 if you have a rent regulatory regime that uh, 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 mandates any succession rights, mandates any occupation, how does that meet public use? And I, again, I was about to say this a bit mixes apples and oranges right. uh, because in the regulatory takings context, we are assuming as a threshold matter that there is what the court in Kilo and a set of cases before Kilo uh, would have considered public use, which is to say, is there uh, a public welfare? Uh, is, is, this, is this within the, the police power of the, of the government, the relevant government? And, and, and again, I don't think Andy would disagree. I don't think most people would disagree that there is at least a rational basis for some rent regulation and some tenant protections because they exist uh, in jurisdictions uh, around the country in various forms. Um, and so we're having a very different argument in the context of a regulatory taking or a physical occupation. We're not really disputing that this is something the government could do in some context, but we're really disputing whether or not they can do it without compensating the owner. Why, why can they do that and not, for instance, regulate supermarket prices, which could also affect the poor? I would say they can regulate uh, supermarket prices. And in the past, they have. Uh, the, the New Deal in the World, World, World War I, World War II, we've had much broader price controls, right? I, I, I think there's a different question about whether the idea of price controls, of regulation of price is constitutional. Uh, it still has to meet uh, a, a due process, but what's called a rational basis, a deferential due process. I think the reason we don't tend to see more price controls in lots of markets uh, has more to do with uh, politics than it has to do with constitutional law. Okay, another question from uh, the audience, and this is somebody who is following uh, this uh, new set of cases as closely as the panel. Uh, and I'm going to turn to Adam for this one. Uh, already in some rent control related cases post Cedar Point, the state has brought up in briefings ye the escondido to distinguish Cedar Point, specifically bringing up the issue that unlike in Cedar Point, the tenants were invited onto the property. What do the panelists think of this assertion and how might it be argued against? I know, for instance, in Pac Pacdell, or is that Pac Bell? Pacdell, the Supreme Court remanded the case down with specific direction to view the case in light of Cedar Point. Again, help us understand the question before you uh, try to respond. Well, sure. I mean, in, in Ye versus Escondido, which is, you know, and it, uh, it was a case fairly, as I think Andy described the case earlier, a case fairly similar to modern rent control, rent stabilization statutes there. I think if I remember correctly, it was, was it mobile homes, mobile, mobile home parks. I mean, you do have a situation where it's not as though the the tenants, the people on the property, just forced themselves onto the property and sort of became squatters on the land. They were invited or allowed on pursuant to the law then applicable at the time to undertake a, a rental contract, just as renters today uh, are. They're, you know, even under the current rent stabilization statutes or laws, when there's a a real you know new renter who's renting for the first time. She or he is, is, is allowed onto the property under existing law, and the landlord decides whether to make a contract 
with the, the would-be renter. And so anybody who's defending the, the rent stabilization laws is going to point back to that and say, this is not about allowing union organizers or government officials or others new rights to enter under under uh, enter onto property, but rather this this case now, the rent stabilization case, is really just the latest iteration of of a challenge to a long-standing regulatory framework allowing for the stabilization of rent. Now, Andy surely will argue, as he sort of alluded to here, that well, the laws are changing, and when the laws do change, not just at the margins but substantially, the landowners really are deprived of what the court has called reasonable investment-backed expectations. This is a perennial problem in regulatory takings law. What's the baseline set of laws that, that are the, the proper basis for what the court called, again, reasonable investment-backed expectations? What are the background principles? And as Andy pointed out, in a case about 20 years ago called Palazzolo versus Rhode Island, the Supreme Court either, depends on how you looked at it, complicated the doctrine or clarified the doctrine by saying that when pro just because property changes hands from one property owner to the next property owner, doesn't mean that the sale of the property kind of grandfathers in any recent changes in, in the law. In that case, the, the first property owner owned, you know, owned the land, might have had a, ta a regulatory takings clause claim, sells it to a successor who I think was sort of related to the first property owner. And the court said that second property owner can still bring what would have been the original takings clause claim. Where I'm going with this is I think the court is going to have to clarify what that means, what are the background laws, and if they're pretty deferential to the pre-existing background laws, then it's going to be tough for challengers of rent control to make a new takings claim. I will say in fairness to the defenders of, of, of rent control here, I do think there is something different about the tenant-landlord relationship, which has been a long-standing relationship, often, especially in New York, subject to rent control regulations, versus in Cedar Point, you know, a newer and more novel form of, of allowing people onto property. That, that's a distinction. It might not ultimately be a distinction that's, 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 that's worth a difference in terms of, of the court's trajectory on, on regulatory takings clause doctrine. But I do think it's a difference that, that the challengers are going to have to grapple with. Yeah, can I, Howard, can I just make... Okay, real quick, because I want to get another quick... For the audience. Following up to Adam, I do think, and this is the distinction I alluded to in Yi, and I think it's also what may have motivated the footnote. I'm glad to see Nestor is also a footnote reader. Um, the footnote in the Pactel, the Pactel decision, uh, basically saying to the Ninth Circuit, you better rethink your substantive analysis in light of Cedar Point. Um, the Pactel uh, question was whether it was basically a, a condo conversion statute. And what it said is, you can only convert your apartment to a condo if you give tenants a lifetime tenancy. And that's what was challenged as a taking. Um, so I think that tells you that at least the court thinks that even though there is a landlord-tenant background. Sometimes even landlord-tenant regulation can go too far. That was obviously designed to protect incumbent tenants from, from non-renewals as if the property owner wanted to sell the condo interest. Um, so that's one point. I, I do think in Yi, the, the physical taking part of Yi that's so important is the court seemed to say, yes, you, the mobile, park, mobile home park owner, don't have much of an interest in who the tenant is subject to law and other things, uh, as long as you're gonna be in the rental business. But, but as I said before, what was critical is you could get out of the rental business in six to 12 months and sort of reclaim your right to exclude by saying, well, I don't wanna be in the, in the resident, in the mobile home pad business, rental business anymore. I wanna use my property for something else. And to me, the, the critical distinction in the New York law is that it's virtually impossible to do that. And that, to me, makes it a lot more like uh, the, what the court has been concerned about in these more recent cases. But also, I think, creates a fair question under Yi. How do you apply that distinction that the court was drawing, even in that 1992 decision? OK, another question from the audience. Uh, and this caught my attention, Esther, and I think it surprised people. Uh, could you elaborate on the Supreme Court's language in striking down the CDC eviction moratorium very much in the news and quite recent, and its implications for the uh, rent regulation case. Absolutely. Uh, but first, let me just pick up on, on what Andy just left off on. Uh, 
um, which is, I think, one of the reasons why he's likely to have a, a friendlier audience in the Supreme Court than in the Second Circuit is the point on how difficult it is to leave the market under the current 2019 version of the rent stabilization law is contested uh, and will be contested for the Second Circuit. The state says uh, 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 with great elaboration that yes, it is limited, but it's not uh, uh, overly limited. Uh, and, and that gets to a value judgment. Uh, so I think it would be different if the state said, simpliciter, you cannot leave the market. It, you have to be a landlord. What they've done is, is regulate the given evidence leading into 2019 of abuses by landlords of vacancy de de control of taking apartments back into their own use and then reconverting them and putting them back on the market. There's sort of a parade of horribles that the state was responding to. And so, yes, they've tightened up the conditions under which a landlord can take the property back for their own use or if they're uh, using a shell company, as, as many people do, uh, uh, there are limitations on that. There, there's sort of disagreements at the about the policy, but there's the, but at least the state is going to make the argument and it seemed convincing to me that this isn't an absolute bar on the ability to exit the market. You can always sell the building and there's a very uh, vigorous market in the city right now for rent regulated units. It's not as though this is a Lucas style, uh, uh, you know, no economic return. Um, uh, but but to answer the question on, on where this language, as I said before, it doesn't directly bear on this case. Uh, the CDC moratorium case was about statutory language. Adam has mentioned the court grappling with this idea of non-delegation. Um, but, but, but to go back to Adam's great point about the kind of tension between uh, originalism, there was no concept of regulatory takings until really 1922. Um, uh, 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 there were all sorts of regulations at the time the takings clause was passed. And I think it would have been highly surprising to the framers, the idea that you could apply the Fifth Amendment um, this was even before the 14th Amendment incorporation, but even as to the federal government, that you could say that a property owner as a matter of takings law could challenge. So there's a sort of originalism problem there. There's a, a kind of judicial standards problem there. And I think the way the court's going to solve all of this, uh, uh, at least this is what this signal in the CDC case seems to be saying, is they're going to look for simple, clear rules. So I, if I had to predict where the law will be in five or 10 years, I think there'll be some either incremental or this is a court that seems to be very eager to uh, flex its new view of constitutional law, I think there might be a wholesale revisit, revisiting. Uh, and, and, and to those of us who follow this stuff pretty closely, Cedar Point Nursery was pretty surprising. Or it wasn't surprising. I think I, I, we predicted where it was going to go, but it was a pretty significant change in the law. And so I think we're going to see uh, increasing pressure put on the Penn Central framework um, and really more and more cases that involve bright line rules. And in this context, unlike non-delegation or gerrymandering, the court can fall back on what it sees, I think erroneously, but what it sees as a kind of simple version of the common law that set really bright lines like the right to exclude. And that's the significance of the CDC case, because they alluded to this as a critical right in a context in which they didn't even need to mention it. They could have really just relied entirely on, on statutory interpretation and a kind of uh, constitutional avoidance shadow of the non-delegation doctrine. Right. So I think there's those in New York who, because of the previous failed challenges, may have viewed this case as quixotic. And what we're hearing today is that is that those who are following the course view it as, as anything but. Is that fair, Adam? Yep, absolutely, absolutely. And again, I think, as has been said a couple of times, it's both a question of the changing trends of the court, but also this case is not exactly the same as the others. And I think those distinctions do need to be taken seriously. Right. And uh, just a reminder for the audience of the, of the stakes, there are about, there are over 1 million rent stabilized apartments in New York City. Uh, will this case be uh, sui generis to, do, to New York Andy, or could it have implications uh, nationally, not only in terms of uh, labor organizers' rights or eviction moratoria, but in terms of rent regulation itself? Well, the, the New York law is probably the most regulatory heavy in the country, but obviously what courts say about what the limitations are and what the standards are will apply to other uh, to other rent regulation laws. And, and you know, they're 
readers of newspapers know that in reaction to lack of housing, uh, you know, there is a movement in a lot of a lot of cities and some states to uh, think about imposing rent regulation, sort of notwithstanding the policy concerns about about what the implications are. Um, you know, I'll, I'll say one thing about the New York rent regulation law that's not part of the takings challenge, but it's part of the reality, which is, is a bit of a lottery ticket. You know, there's no test, means test, or other test uh, about who is entitled to get or stay in a, a rent regulation, a rent regulated apartment, especially since the elimination of the off ramps from from uh, control that Nestor talked about. So it is a, uh, a a sort of a remarkable program in that sense. Will that matter at all? Last question and real quick, Nestor, will it matter at all that uh, there may not be a rational basis because crazy things happen because of rent regulation, all sorts of distortions happen. Does that matter at all for cases like these? I, I think ultimately, no. I don't think we're at the point of, you know, there there is a disagreement about the details of rent regulation. There's a legitimate argument we can have, as, as Andy mentioned, about better policies, worse policies. The thought that, that, that the court is going to resolve that as opposed to deferring that specific question, as opposed to deferring to the political branches, uh, I, I, I just don't see it. Okay, I'm, I'm not getting a signal, but I'm showing that we're at time. And so uh, I want to thank our panelists, uh, Andy Pinkus, Adam White, and Nestor Davidson for walking us through what could be could be a landmark case regarding rent regulation in New, in New York State, mainly as applied to New York City. So stay tuned and uh, uh, thank again, thanks again to our panelists. And thanks for our audience. Thank you. Thank you.